Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining this production focus on the upcoming feature documentary, Brian Cox, Seven Days on Mars. I'm Ash Potterton, an executive producer at Arrow Media, and to discuss the making of the film, I'm delighted to be joined by our panel this evening uh, from Seattle, Professor Brian Cox, CBE, uh, from London, the film's director, Mickey Lackman, Oh. And, and joining us from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, or JPL for short, uh, in Pasadena, California, is Dr. Vandy Verma, uh, the Chief Engineer, Perseverance Robotic Operations on the Mars 2020 mission. Uh, before we start, um, just a brief background to, to the film. As you know, uh, the story of Perseverance Rover's exploration of Mars has captured the world's attention. And in this film, Brian Cox ventures behind the scenes at JPL for seven days, just as the rover embarks on the most demanding part of its mission to date, setting off for the sites most likely to reveal the signs of life. The film also explores the big picture story about the search for life on the red planet, what that kind of life might look like, how we're going to attempt to bring Martian rock samples back to Earth and the risks that that poses, and how what we find on Mars could potentially transform our view of life within the universe. The film TX is next Friday, the 17th of June at 9 p.m. on BBC Two and will be available on iPlayer shortly afterwards. And we're gonna kick off with a clip where you'll see Brian come face to face uh, in JPL's Mars Yard, uh, come face to face with Perseverance's identical twin, Optimism, as it tests its auto navigation function. As the rover drives forwards, it's constantly imaging the ground in front, building a map of the obstacles that it will need to avoid. In this case, me. She's just taking some more images to update her nav map. And then she has to decide how to get around you. So it should be oh. identifying. There you go. Looks like she has identified you as an obstacle and yeah. is choosing to turn. So it looks like she's not going to drive over you. It does. Although the wheels are slightly recessing towards me. <laughs> she's going to make a close pass, I think. Excellent. It's gone straight over the GoPro. <laughs> so she was very careful with me, but not so careful with our cameras. <laughs> So, Ryan, what was it like coming face to face with that extraordinary machine? It's, um, as you said, it is an extraordinary piece of engineering. It's um, Vandy will be able to comment better than me on the challenges of driving a rover on Mars. But uh, the, the, the basic point is that you can't really drive very far if you try to do it by remote control from Earth because of the delay time. So there's got to be a lot of intelligence built into the rover, and that's difficult. Uh, so th this is a you know it's clearly a tremendously valuable piece of equipment. And so you can't take chances with it, but at the same time, you have to allow it to make its own decisions to a large extent. And then, so that was, it was interesting. One of the things, you know, making television, there's always this, an idea, is there any jeopardy here? And of course, <laughs> there isn't really, because it's a careful piece of navigation that it does. So it does, as you see, drives particularly slowly. So uh, I didn't actually feel in any danger. And of course, it's a very intelligent piece of, uh, <laughs> you know, machinery. So it wasn't going to drive over me anyway. And I could have stood up and walked away. <laughs> Um, I just wonder, um, obviously what we're seeing there is uh, one, a, a glimpse of sort of one scene within the context of a 90 minute film. Um, Mickey, do you perhaps want to just give an overview of, uh, of the shoot uh, and the whole sort of seven day framework of the film? Um, yes, uh, well, as you said very nicely, we had, we had seven days at JPL, for seven days on Mars. I suppose the overview for the shoot was that we had to, out of this, seven days we had to get a 90 minute film and 
we didn't know what was going to happen when we showed up. We had various things lined up, like we knew we were going to be able to go and see the Optimism rover in the Mars yard. We knew we were going to go to Mission Control, but we had genuinely no idea what the rover was going to be doing, whether it was going to be doing anything at all. Um, so as a sort of production challenge, it was very much an issue of, of sort of screwing up your courage and jumping into this environment and saying, we are going to follow what happens here and having faith that what's going to happen is going to be interesting enough to fill a film with just, we, we, we did really did just have the seven days to film it, to make this 90 minute film and a 45 minute presentless version. So I suppose the, the, the big challenge was to make sure we, we captured enough action and excitement that would carry both us and the viewers through the, through the whole length of the program. Yeah. Um, tell me, you, you touch on, um, touch on the mission there. I just wonder if Vandy, perhaps you could just give for the benefit of everyone, an overview of the mission of what it's achieved so far and what it's planned, uh, what is planned for the near future. Yeah, it was uh, really exciting to have, uh, you know, you communicate this uh, to the public because we live on Mars, uh, exploring it and uh, on an everyday basis. The mission is part of the journey of us trying to understand the history of Mars and could it once have harbored ancient life. So we're looking for signs of ancient life. And what's unique about Perseverance is we have the capability to drill into the surface, collect rock cores and cache them, which we're gonna bring back with a subsequent mission. And we have found incredibly different environment. We, we are in this delta, uh, ancient river delta. So we're in Jezero Crater, which has an ancient river delta because that is likely to have one of the highest probability of harboring signs of ancient life. And we've, at this point in the mission, we've collected eight cores. We've driven over 12 kilometers to get to different sites, to collect different variation and diversity of, of the samples. And so it's been very exciting. And we also, uh, the mission also includes a helicopter. And so we've been able to fly the helicopter to also observe from different perspective than we get from the rover, the aerial views and scout out for the rover, and it's done 28 flights. Uh, so it's been it's been a very exciting mission. Um, fascinating. And we, what we're going to do is we'll talk later in due course about some of the sort of unpredictability of it, because as Mickey mentioned, um, when uh, when we got there, we genuinely had no idea of what was what was going to happen. And there's an interesting sort of backstory to that, which we can unpack later. Um, but this was also a film that um, Brian, for you, had a very personal uh, element to it. And I wondered if you could uh, talk a bit about that, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been interested in space exploration since I was <laughs> as far back as I can remember. And um, when I was, um, I think I was about 10 years old or so, I, uh, I was interested in Voyager at the time, launched in 1977, and also Viking, which landed on Mars in the 74, 75. And um, so I wrote to JPL, J Jet Pulsion Lab, as something that I knew about um, when I was eight, nine, 10 years old. And, and so I wrote to JPL and JPL replied with a, with a package with photographs from Jupiter and Saturn as it was at the time. I think it was about 1980 when I, when I got the, the photographs back and also the surface of Mars from the Viking missions. Um, so I'd known, I've had imprinted on my mind as you do when you're absolutely obsessed with something at the age of eight, nine or 10, the address of JPL, 9,800 Oak Road, Drive, Pasadena, California, CA 9110. I can, I can say it, right? Because I was so excited when this package came back. And it's one of the most wonderful things that NASA does. It doesn't only, as Vandy said, attempt to answer some of the biggest questions that we can ask. In this case, are we alone in the universe? Right? It's a huge question. And we have the technology now to possibly find an answer to that question. But also it engages with the next generation. It engages with people who are interested. And that's a vital part of its mission. And so you saw that. So, so, when, I, so, so every, when I can get to walk down through the gates of JPL, through this place that I've known about since I was eight years old, it's, it's just a tremendous privilege for me. Fantastic. Um, I want to just go on to talk a bit about the unpredictability of 
what we face, which is something that we touched on um, in a couple of those previous questions and the inherent unpredictability of, of space exploration. Uh, we've got a clip that speaks to that. And uh, this is a moment where um, Brian discovers that Perseverance, which is going to set out on this uh, uh, lengthy journey in the seven day period, uh, is actually unable to get started. So if we could play, uh, play that clip, please. Before it's even started its record-breaking drive, the rover is facing a problem that could delay its progress. And it stems from this. The last task in its investigation of the crater floor was to take a rock sample from this boulder, informally known as SID. So what have we got? This is a very interesting image because we are trying to take a core sample of this rock and uh, the rock was too hard and the coring faulted. It stopped with the drill still stuck in the rock. It's not supposed to be like that. I suppose you don't want to break a drill bit. Right? That's it's exactly right. If the rock is too hard, you start to dull the drill bit and we have a small number of drill bits, and once they're all dull, we're not gonna be collecting any more rocks. So we are very careful not to push the drill too hard. And while the drill is stuck in the rock, the rover can't go anywhere. Mickey, uh, we touched on the journey that Perseverance was undertaking in that seven day period in the film that forms the, the backbone to the film. And I wondered if you could just explain a bit about that, please. Um, well, yes, I mean, the, uh, I'll, I'll take it back even a bit further than that and the, the, the unpredictability stakes because yeah. I mean, we arrived and, and found the drill stuck in the rock, but this was actually the second time uh, that we tried to film the, the mission. The first time, this was originally commissioned as a show for the, for the landing, for the anniversary of the landing of Perseverance on Mars in February, and we've been due to film in early January. And that was exactly the time, as you remember, that the bigger micron surge came through the UK and America. And on Christmas Eve, we pulled the shoot that was meant to start on the 4th of January. And we thought at the time that that was potentially a disaster. And we didn't know what was going to happen afterwards. And as we watched what happened on Mars, uh, for the time we were meant to be filming there, it suddenly felt like we, we completely dodged a bullet. Because in the week we were meant to be filming, uh, the rover had had a mechanical difficulty. It got some pebbles stuck in one of its drills. Um, for the entire week we were meant to be there, the rover did did nothing. Didn't move, didn't turn its wheels over, didn't take any measurements, didn't take any photos. It just sat there. And so, I mean, that you know, clearly would have been a big challenge for us. So when we went, when COVID had subsided and we were able to go back at the beginning of March, um, that was always at the back of our minds. What if we, we show up again and, and still nothing happens? What are we going to do? And we work in, walk in on this first morning and, and it's meant to be beginning a new uh, you know, important stage of its journey. It's going to start this long drive. It's going to try and drive further in a week, in a few weeks to get to the Delta than any rover has ever gone before on a mission. And that sounds very exciting. We're all geared up and ready to go for this great mission. And we get in on that first morning to the very long for these things it is very much you know you get put and, and there it is that it comes through on the on the picture being downloaded that morning there they go the drills stuck in the rock and it's like you know what are we going to do and luckily for us i mean they had a plan to get it out and that became part of a of the narrative that sort of drove the rest of the program that we're able to follow through is you know what's going to happen with the rover can it get its drill out and will it start on this this drive that hopefully is going to be be record-breaking but Brian, can you talk a bit about um, just, you know, this is following that kind of in the moment storytelling is quite different from some of the recent output that you've done. And I wonder if you could just talk a bit about what that experience was like for you in terms of following events in the moment as they as they unfolded. Well, for me, it's, um, as I said before, that this has been a part of my life for the, well for most of my life actually my, my interest in space exploration so actually it was it's almost not like making a television program and M mickey will be able to comment probably on the on the frustration because i get so excited and so involved and i'm just so interested that for me it's an extremely easy thing 
to sit at Jet Propulsion Lab for seven days and follow a space mission. It's 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 almost an irrelevance to me that there are cameras there. Actually, <laughs> so it's one of the one of the easier assignments that I've had in television. Um, Vandy, I just wondered um, in terms of uh, you know the mission itself. Uh, you know, we kind of think I think the sort of popular perception is of you know NASA being full of incredibly clever people, which it is. You know, who've got everything figured out. But the reality of space exploration is that, as Ken Farley, the uh, um, mission scientist, said uh, says at one point in the film that uh, every day brings new surprises. And I wonder if you could give. Um, uh, people some insight into just how many curveballs you get presented on a mission like this. Right. And, you know, we you look at Mars and it looks a lot like Earth. And for those of us, you know, I've been uh, between Mars Exploration Rovers, Curiosity and now Perseverance. I've been operating rovers and driving on Mars for almost 14 years. And like you say, there are a lot of people who, like Brian, were interested in this, saw something at a young age and really wanted to work on space. And they're, you know, they've got the skills and developed the skills for it. And part of the reason they stay engaged and interested is every day you do have a challenge and you get to solve, really utilize the skills you have to solve a problem that uh, is unusual. So that's what keeps it really interesting from a robotics point of view, which is uh, where I work with. And also from science, you're solving a puzzle you're trying to understand, could there have been ancient life here? And the example, I, I, I thought it was so great when they're talking about uh, that, the first example where they, was, where, where they were gonna come and film and we had to deal with COVID. We were actually operating the mission landed during COVID and we had to really redo our operations facility so we could keep everyone safe because you don't want a critical team all getting sick either. So we really had to work through that. But the moment where he was mentioning that there was a pebble and nothing happened for a week, I was thinking about it and was like, wow, that was such a busy week because there's actually a lot happening. We were analyzing that and doing motions to try and get that pebble out. Uh, so that was one example where we had poured so many rocks on Mars, uh, on Earth, before we go to Mars. And we have the world's experts in Mars uh, geology telling us what the uh, rocks will be like. But when we got to Mars, the very first rock we drilled, we didn't collect a core because it uh, almost like had characteristics where there was hardness, but at the same time it shattered and we didn't, we didn't get a core. So we're going to Mars partly because we don't know everything about it and we're trying to, to learn more. And that's, we encounter these situations. Uh, the same thing happened when the drill was stuck. That was actually too hard. We, the drill is smart enough so that when it's drilling, if the rock is hard, it'll adjust and uh, change its uh, level to do more percussion. Or sometimes if it's really soft, which we've had the case where it would just use its rotary mechanism. Uh, in this particular case, it was beyond what would be uh, something we wanted to do. As you know, Ken was saying in the clip, we don't want to dull our bits. And so in this particular case, it stopped we were able to break that core and take the amount of sample we've collected. And it's going to be one of the samples we'd be very interested in analyzing uh, when it comes back to Earth. But it's, it's definitely one of the most fun parts of these missions is that there are so many surprises and you get to problem solve almost daily. Brian, was that something that you, you know, you really enjoyed seeing that, those kind of problems up close and seeing how people solve them in the moment? Well, absolutely. As, as Vandy said, it's, um, th th this is exploration. So, uh, and I found it, uh, it's remarkably interesting to see how the, going all the way back to the design of these spacecraft, how they're designed with so much flexibility um, because they have to be designed in such a way. And so it's interesting to see how um, we call them problems, but they're 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 things that it is known be, because that, that unknown <laughs> issues are going to occur, and the spacecraft are designed in such a way. But I find it very interesting actually talking about the pebble. I talked to several people about that, and um, it, the, so obviously people knew that pebbles, pieces of Mars, could get stuck in this mechanism, and the mechanism was designed to deal with that. 
but a lot of the engineers said to me, um, it's one thing knowing that you've gone through all these design reviews for years and years and years, um, saying, yes, we designed it, it's fine, uh, it's not a problem, it, we, we know how to deal with the problem. And then facing the problem when your spacecraft is on Mars. So, you know, if, if there's just this, if you mess that up, then this is the sample collection mechanism. Um, so you, if you jam that up, then you, what are you going to do? So um, it was interesting to talk to the engineers about the, the I, perhaps the, it's the wrong word, but the psychology of, of having worked through these problems in the design phase and indeed designed the spacecraft beautifully so it can deal with them and then actually facing one of these problems in reality. Um, I, th I think it feels like a great point to um, go on to our next clip, uh, which is a clip of where you meet Vandy and um, we see how Vandy works to uh, achieve amazing things by controlling Perseverance 200 million miles away. Uh, if we could play that clip, please. Using the 3D images, Vandy can begin to plot Perseverance's route through the obstacles. Essentially, we are saying we want to navigate around this area. So we are doing the path so it goes around this, but we don't want to go over here because it's very sandy. And sand, actually, the wheels don't do very well. Oh, yeah. You can see all the layers as you start. In hazardous terrain like this, the only way the rover can safely find its way is by following Vandy's carefully plotted route. But this mode of rover driving is slow. It's only possible to program around 30 meters of driving each day, nowhere near enough to cover the distances required to reach the delta. So once the rover reaches safer ground, Vandy points it in the right direction and activates its secret weapon. So now we're gonna turn on AutoNav because the rover will know more on Mars at that point than we know here. Um. Fandy, it's extraordinary this because just seeing it on the screen there to uh, to the layperson, it almost looks like some kind of video game, and it's easy to forget there's a two point seven billion dollar rover at stake there. Uh, I just wondered if you could give uh, people some insight, please. You know, just into the the challenges of that role. You know, the the time delay involved, how it works, and uh, just unpack a bit more about your um, your your extraordinary role on the mission, please. Yeah, so driving is on Mars is really interesting because, you know, when you think of driving, you think uh, of taking an action and seeing the response really quickly. You're steering the wheel or you hit the brakes. Mars is interesting because it's so far away and it just one way light time, the signal can take from four to 20 minutes, depending on where Earth and Mars are. So we really send the commands for an entire Martian day, which we call a SOL to Mars. So you're telling the rover all of the things it needs to do in, and adjust because there are certain things we can predict, but other things like, you know, if it encounters a really sandy patch, how much is it going to slip? How much is it going to need to compensate for that? So we utilize the capability it has on the rover. So you're sort of thinking of what's the rover going to do in that situation and how much should I constrain it? So in the clip you were seeing, we started out knowing that we want, we were backing up actually from the rock we were talking about, Sid, where the drill had been stopped. So we were backing up from the rock and then building a map of the terrain, which the rover will later use to navigate. So we start to build the map so that it knows what it's on, what it is under it and navigating very carefully around the local terrain, uh, which humans on earth can see. But once we are past that, it's taking images and it knows what the challenges in the terrain around it are much more in much more detail than we can see sitting on earth you know now that it's much further along so what we do is we plan these routes by getting the images from mars around the rover we put them in our rover driving tool which you know sort of as you were seeing can look like a video game uh, but very aware of where the data is, what parts we are seeing with real sensing and imagery and where there are occlusions. You're seeing it from the rover's perspective and we have orbital imagery, but there are certain things we know we don't have data on in and we sort of uh, try to imagine what the worst thing could be over there. We put on our 3D goggles because that really gives us a perspective of the terrain where there aren't 
recognizable features so you can get a false sense of it being really benign and flat but when you put the goggles on it really comes alive and you can see just the undulations in the terrain and once we've done that we start to very precisely put our waypoints for how we're going to drive and so then we put uh, we simulate in our simulation tools which put tracks on it now you can start to analyze is that track sufficient distance from a hazard which could be a drop off a crater ram or a big boulder uh, or even certain sometimes we're looking at smaller rocks and we want to avoid them because it might add more uncertainty as we go over it and make the drive less precise so we do that we put the tracks and then we simulate the drive and keep asking the what if questions of what is it that could go wrong in the situation and how can I alter the drive to uh, use the flexibility we have to reduce the chances of anything going wrong and us still getting to the goal that we're trying to get to that day. Um, Mickey, I just wondered if you could speak a bit about the, also from your perspective, when we talk about, think about just access to filming a scene like this with Vandy, the reality was that we were working within quite a constrained, very constrained time environment. And I wonder if you could speak a bit about how you managed to, uh, how you managed to cope with that. Um, yeah, I mean, well, the, for starters, I mean, the access is in, incredibly pr privileged. I mean, you don't very often get access to a place like JPL to see it working as it does day to day. Um, But at the same time, you know, it's a working environment. There are a lot of very busy people in there going about their jobs. And they, you know, the, the moments we want to capture are probably the moments where, you know, they've got, you know, least time for dealing with a film crew. So it was a very busy period. We would, they, they, they were very generous with their time with us, but they were still, you know, it happens in real time what we're following with them doing. So they have a set period of, of the day where, they're, where, they're, where pictures come down or where they're driving the rover. And we get pushed, we go into those scenes and, you know, the meetings last 50 minutes, so maybe they last an hour to, to program a bit of the rover's drive. We've got to capture everything we can in that period. So, I mean, in our seven days, we shot something like 40 sequences. Some of them were very straightforward, some of them less straightforward. And so it became very much a, a question, a, a, a sort of exercise in strip back filmmaking. It's, you know, what can we do in this hour to capture this film and the excitement and the sequence and everything that's in it as effectively as possible. Um, and so we developed a way where we, we made sure that for like, I mean, that scene with Vandy, we shot on two cameras. Many of our interviews were shot on three cameras because we knew we wouldn't have the chance to go back and do reshoots and pickups. So we we're trying to pick up everything we could as we went so that we would, as you know, we'd be capturing events as they happened. And I think that's, you know, the approach that took us throughout the week was just, you know, trying to, to make sure we kept everything perhaps not entirely in one clean go, but certainly not much more than that. And I think that comes through in the film as well. I think you do get that sense of, of you know, real time, you know, activity and the, the mission progressing as we go through the week. Brian, Brian, what's it like when you put the, uh, when you put the goggles on? Oh, the 3D it's, goggles. Um, it, it, as Randy said, it's extremely interesting because you, you get a, a an extremely I suppose you'd call it situational awareness, right? You, you really do get a feel for, for being there on the surface of Mars and, and key for the navigation is, is you get a feel for that terrain in far more detail than you can get from the 2D images. So it really is, I think, a, a, an extremely valuable tool. Okay. Um, well, look, we, um, we touched on there, I mean, just getting that sense of the, the surface of Mars. And one of the things that the film does is it really tries to give that impression about to bring you as close as possible to what it's like on the surface of Mars. And we're just going to play um, the final clip now, which um, shows you some of the stunning images that have been taken by Perseverance and uh, explains a bit about what it's like on the surface of Mars. So if we could play that clip, please. It is a stark and barren landscape, dimmer than the Earth. Because it's farther from the sun, less than half the amount of sunlight reaches the surface. But in some ways, it looks remarkably familiar. There are sand dunes and boulder fields that could have been photographed in deserts here on Earth. 
There are even clouds in the orange colored skies. And because Perseverance is the only Martian rover to carry microphones, we can hear the sounds of Mars for the first time. The whistling of the wind that stirs up the dust devils that ghost across the surface. Mickey, um, can you talk a bit about just the different scales that the film operated on? Because obviously on one level, it follows the day-to-day -day, in the moment events as they unfold with that live exploration uh, from JPL, but obviously it's also trying to tell the epic big picture story about um, how Mars developed as a planet and the search for life. So uh, can you just talk a bit about how you married those two different uh, scales of narrative? Yes, I mean, there, 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 there's a, a couple of different scales there. There's, a, there's the scales of, of space. So, you know, it's, you know it's, the film is meant to be about seven days on Mars, and we really wanted Mars to be a big character in the film. But, you know, we're obviously we're filming in Pasadena for a week, so it's a question of how we we portray Mars and the activity that's, that's happening on Mars. And we're very lucky with that. I mean, Perseverance is equipped with these brilliant cameras that... Uh, that sent back, you know, so far, I think Perseverance has sent back about 200,000 images, and they're remarkable. And we were very lucky as well to get access uh, or help from a from a British uh, space enthusiast, actually, called Sean Doran, who then takes the pictures and stitches them together to make these incredible and gives them a bit of a, a visual look and get Craig's <coughs> we wanted to use that as often as possible to get away from Pasadena and get out you know, 200 million miles away to Mars to see, you know, so what was actually happening on Mars uh, became a feature. And then there's a, then there's a time aspect that, you know, we, we in, for the one narrative of the program is what's happening in a week. Uh, you know, what is the rover going to manage to do from day one to, to day seven? Is it going to make its long drive across towards the Delta? But at the same time, you know, the, the, the overriding story of the film, the thing that makes it, you know, that, that gives it real, you know, poignancy is that, you know, it's a search for life on Mars. And that's not something that happens over a week. We're talking, you know, at the same time about what happened on Mars 3.8 billion years ago. So there's a sort of time jumping narrative in that as well. As well as going through throughout the week, we're jumping back to Jezero Crater 3.8 billion years ago and thinking about, you know, So it's a way of, you know, trying to intercut those two things, both the, the space dimension, you know, jumping back and forth between Earth and Mars and also the time dimension, what we're doing today and how that relates to the distant past, you know, billions and billions of years ago when Mars was a, a young planet, very much like we think the Earth was at the time. I mean, that's a, the, the, I was say that's the interesting thing about the, the search for life on Mars is that, you know, early in their history, we think these two planets were very similar to each other. They were, covered in water relatively warm had an atmosphere and so if, uh, if life evolved on earth could it have evolved on mars at the same time and that's uh, you know as we explore towards the end of the film a very important question yeah but brian could you pick up on that on what the, the different there's different scenarios you outline at the end of the at the end of the film about what we might find or not find and what the significance of that might be and fundamentally why why should why we should care about whether we find life on ancient life on mars or not well, the, the, the question of the, the, the nature of the origin of life on Earth is, is a, obviously a very interesting and very difficult question to answer um, because we have good evidence that life on Earth was around about 3.8 billion years ago, um, uh, perhaps earlier. And uh, those are our ancestors. Right? There's an unbroken chain of life that stretched back from us and every living thing on the planet today to something that happened perhaps 3.8 billion years ago. Now, on Earth... Earth is an active planet and has remained so for that 3.8 billion years. Remember, that's about a third of the age of the universe. It's a very, very long time. Um, and so the evidence for the origin of life on Earth is really raised. So the way that we try to explore that today is to look for commonalities in all the living things on Earth. And really what we're looking for, a, a way to think about it is to say, well, what could the origin of life have been? What kind of physical process is it? It has to be a transition from geochemistry to biochemistry because you've, a planet forms and it's, it's a dead world, it's not a living world. 
And then at some point on Earth, then geology, active geology, became what we now call biochemistry, so complex carbon chemistry. And we have some good theories by looking for commonalities that all living things share. So geological type uh, sort of processes in the biology. We have some ideas that life may have begun, for example, in hydrothermal vent systems on the floors of the ancient oceans of Earth. Um, what's interesting about Mars is that, so if we find evidence that life began on Mars, a second genesis, then first of all, that clearly tells us that life is going to be common throughout the universe because there was a second genesis in a single solar system. So if not, if, if not lending a sense of inevitability to the origin of life, at least what it's telling you is that there's a reasonable probability that given the right conditions, it will happen. But what's also interesting about Mars is if you'd stood in Jezero Crater uh, three billion years ago, um, then it would have looked broadly the same. Because not if life began on Mars, then not long after that, Mars went into deep freeze. Um, so kind of paradoxically, the, the evidence for the origin of life um, may be better preserved on Mars than it could ever be here on Earth. So, and I think going back to something Mickey said, that for me, that's the interesting thing about this film, but also philosophically about space exploration. At one level, it's about detail. It's about engineering, it's about precision, and it's about technology and, and these huge teams that we see at JPL coming together, some of the best people in the world to do something that is very difficult. But at the other end of the scale, simultaneously, it's one of the grandest philosophical quests, right? We are in through that engineering excellence, trying to answer deep philosophical questions. In this case, we're really asking questions about ourselves as well as the universe. We're saying, how is it that collections of atoms, essentially as old as time, are processed in the hearts of long dead stars can come together to, to be us, right? How is it the universe gets to explore itself and understand itself? Those are the questions that Perseverance is seeking to answer. Fandy, what's your what, what's your take on that in terms of you know when you're when you're doing your job you know what heads you know you're obviously in the headspace the day to day headspace of doing your job but in terms of the broader philosophical uh, picture that Brian touches on you know what what is it that uh, how is it that you view what you do? You know, Brian summarized it so well, and I think we we are a team of people who have very skilled in a lot of different areas. So we have scientists who are every day thinking of these broader philosophical questions. And then the intermediate long-term planners and other uh, parts of the science team saying, how do we currently, what we see in front of us, how do we use the instruments we have on the rover to answer that bigger question? Because we always keep that front and center. And then it comes down to the engineering teams and the robotics, for example, what I work on are driving to say, we are trying to get to something, how do I keep this rover safe? Because it's one asset I have on Mars and if I lose it, I can continue to answer these questions. And, but I'm going to try really hard to get that science and to position the instrument above this really tiny millimeters uh, level scale feature that they're interested in looking at with instruments, you know, and uh, the robotic arm has a turret that's 45 kilograms and it's a hundred kilogram arm with all the group, you're positioning it within centimeters of this. So you're always aware of what your, you know, the risks involved and yet how important it is to get those measurements so that we can answer these questions. And I think just from a personal level, when you go to work every day and you look at these images, it starts to become a really familiar place. You kind of know how the rover is going to drive on Mars, how the arm behaves. And, and yet sometimes, you know, you step back and uh, try to, you know, think of the fact that Mars is so far away, that we are talking about a place that no human has ever been to. And we are there. And so I think that responsibility of 
the role you play in helping to answer these questions is a tremendous one and you're constantly aware of that. Uh, I sometimes, you know, when I look at Mars in the night sky, when it's visible, just think of just how far it is and the fact that we have a rover there that we are able to get it to look at these features is sort of brings brings it all together so i think you know those two parts of it constantly stay there and then you step into the mode where you're just trying to solve a specific problem ahead of you uh, and go ahead and you know accomplish that so i think that's that's what is wonderful about this is there are people thinking about all the different aspects every day uh, sometimes i come in early for a shift so when the images are down you just sit and you get that uh, moment to just uh, observe them and absorb being on Mars. You know, the images that you were showing before this, they're just so spectacular. And the rover is able to transport us all to the surface to experience some of that. Great. Well, thank you for that insight. And um, um, the film delivers a bit of that as well. When, um, um, I mean, Brian, you, you, you see some of, you just speak about you, you're there seeing images that no, no human eye has seen before, aren't you, as they come through? Yeah, it's um, exploration. As you said, we genuinely, when that rover moves, you have a view of Mars that no one has ever seen. And um, it is interesting, I think, what you saw in that clip, that you do see a world that looks extremely similar to Earth. And that's one of the, I think, the most important things about Mars. And um, there are three planets, actually, in our solar system that are inside what's called a habitable zone, which is a region around the star where possibly uh, conditions could be right for life to arise on a planet. The, actually, you can argue that on the moons um, of Jupiter and Saturn, those conditions may also exist, so the habitable zone may be bigger. But broadly speaking, there are three Earth-like worlds in the solar system. And so the, the idea that Mars is the only one of those other than Earth that we can stand on, that Venus, which is the other one, is, is a horrendous place now, um, runaway greenhouse effect, 90 times atmospheric pressure here on Earth, 450 degrees Celsius or something on the surface could melt lead. Um, and then the other planets, if you think about it, the Mercury is too hot, the rest of them are made of gas. <laughs> so there's actually only one other planet planet in the solar system that we could ever stand upon, and that's Mars. And um, so you see a, a familiar world, but as Vandy said, it's also, we have to remember, an alien world many hundreds of millions of miles away. Great. Well, look, thank you all. I'm going to open it up to some questions, uh, and I'm going to, uh, a good number of questions have come in, so I'm going to throw some out there. Mickey, I'm going to start with you. Um, a question. 12 cut minutes a day is fairly high. How many crews did you have on the shoot? Uh, and you might want to just t touch about touch on the uh, presenterless version, because obviously we're doing two films at the same time as well. Yeah, slightly more than 12 cut, version, 12, 12 cut minutes a day, because uh, we made a 90 minute version and then an hour presenterless version from what we shot in that day. Mm -hmm. So we did have, well, we effectively had one big crew. We had two camera operators with us. There was a third camera that I operated. Uh, but by and large, uh, we stayed together as a unit. It was quite difficult to, to split apart. There were various security issues at, at NASA. So it's a question of, of tooling those resources to make the most efficient use of time. So I say, over the course of sequences, sequences, you know, sometimes the, you, you think you shoot in half a day, we were shooting in an hour. Uh, so, yes, we had a very well drilled team. We got better as it through, as the week went on as well. I should add, you know, it wasn't plain sailing. It was quite a difficult challenge, but we, you know, we found a, a, a very smooth way of working in the end. And yeah, so it was yeah, three cameras in one unit, and then yeah, grabbing GVs as and when we would, which I, you know, we could. Which I think Brian was quite pleased about because he hates me making him walk up and down, filming him again and again and again. Well, I, I was gonna. I was just going to chip in there. I think um, for me, it's it's refreshing because really what it does, and I think you see this in the film, is it focuses the film on content because you actually haven't got the time to um, to to you know record as, as Mickey said, lots of very beautiful GVs. There are beautiful GVs in the film, but um, not so many because there wasn't the time. And for me, actually, that introduces a pace 
into the film, which I particularly like. I think it's, um, it's often the case that if you have a lot of time, a lot of technology and plenty of time to absorb beautiful views, then I think as a result, the, the film can slow down when the films that you see become more impressionistic and very beautiful. But the, the thing I like about this is we're forced into deeper content just by that constraint. And I like that. It's a way that, of working that I like. Yeah, I would add it does look quite nice as well. Oh, it looks beautiful. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. Um, well, and, and the, I suppose the big advantage is that we also have these beautiful views. We had a, we, we did have a fourth camera, of course, which is Perseverance. Yes, the well, line Jean extra cameras, but yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but just in terms of, there was, well, it looks nice because quite early on, we made the decision that we shoot on prime lenses. So although we're rushing around with two and three cameras, they're all on primes. Now, thinking about how we did it, if I did it again, I might not do that. I might stick zooms on because it would have made, you know, coverage a lot easier. But it does certainly add to the, to the look of the program that it's, you know, it's shot on these beautiful lenses. As Mickey knows, I, I like that as well because I'm a, a camera lens collector. And actually, I, I try to force or push uh, productions into primes because I just like them and quite often actually we didn't do on this shoot actually but on previous shoots we I, I carry my lens bag with me and we tend to stick a few of those vintage lenses on and I, I again I like the aesthetic I like the look so that's a I almost try to write into my contract that no zoom lenses will be used in the production of this. <laughs> you know I try to do that it doesn't work but I try <laughs> Um, question for Vandy. Um, Vandy, what would constitute evidence when looking for ancient life? Right. So, you know, I, I'll clarify, you know, here I'm sort of not the planetary scientist, but when we are looking for signs of ancient life, there is, there's a lot of correlated observations we make. So we have, we are, the, the biggest thing we're doing is we're collecting intact cores and with the subsequent mission we're actually going to launch from mars we're going to have a you know rendezvous and have that a capsule in which we put all these tubes brought back to earth and then we'll be able to use all the laboratories on earth to sort of look for the biosignatures that tell us whether that sample contains those signatures of life but while we are on mars we also take a lot of context information because that completes the story so while from where we core, we place, we have instruments, we have spectrometers and uh, a lot of other instruments that we use and we place them on the surface to collect measurements in situ of that, of that context, of that environment from which we took this core that also helps to answer the question. So it's very much a correlated set of observations with multiple instruments. So you're not looking at some noise in an instrument or some sort of uh, uh, artifact, you really are able to correlate and corroborate this. Because if you're gonna say something like you found life, you wanna be really sure that you're, 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 you, know, you verified that. And that's why we use all of these instruments. And it's, going to, it's much more complicated than sort of a particular observation we make that answers that question. Um, yeah, I, I just to, and, to pick up on that, one of the, I think it's in the film, but one of the, 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 the mission scientists said that if you think about looking for ancient life on Earth, so there are structures called stromatolites, for example, that we find off the, off the coast of Western Australia, and uh, the proving to the satisfaction of the scientific community that those things were biological in origin took decades, decades. And that's actually when we can go and we, we have them and they're on our planet and we can take them into laboratories. And so it, it is, uh, as Vandy said, um, the, the sense I got was that the, all the measurements that Perseverance is making, there's, there's an instrument called Sherlock, for example, which is a very complicated set of instruments, spectrometry and so on, that can characterize the rock, looking for patterns in the rocks on Mars that could be biological in origin. So the traces that life was there, all that has to be put together with uh, Earth-based analysis of those samples. And even then, even if you're looking at life on Earth, as I said, it can take decades to convince everyone that you really are seeing ancient biological activity. Um, in terms of the timescale, I just wonder, um, Vanny, we've got another question in which was about 
uh, when will the samples taken on Mars be picked up and returned to Earth? So just to manage expectations in case people uh, thought it was happening next year or something, I just wondered if you could give uh, just an outline <laughs> of uh, when, that, when that's projected to happen. Right, so we are still collecting our sample cores. So we've collected eight of them. And you know, one of the other things, just connecting it to the previous question is, we also have what we call witness tubes. So we collect these observations, which are almost like blanks, because we are trying to observe the ambient environment. And that's going to give us a baseline. So we are able to tell that, you know, did we carry anything from Earth or was there any anything in the tubes? And that's going to help us also answer this question. But we are still in the process of collecting all of our samples. And once we've finished, you know, the delta is where we've arrived at. And that's where we had the most probability of, uh, we think, of finding signs of ancient life. And so here we are abrading the surfaces, deploying the Pixel, Sherlock, and Watson instruments that I think Brian touched upon to look at what is the most interesting place in which I can collect the room, you know, the additional cores. And once these cores are collected, we're going to cache them on the surface and a subsequent mission is going to come and land. And that's going to then collect all the samples and launch from Mars and be returned to Earth uh, sometime in the 2030s. So that's how long that mission uh, is, is being developed now. We are actually already working on that mission in parallel because it, it really uh, works with perseverance because we need to determine how we collect these cores impacts how then the subsequent mission will be able to pick them up and what we're doing is very much connected to it. So yeah, it'll be sometime in the 2030s. And that's part of the reason I, I, I really get excited talking about the work we are doing, especially to students, because a lot of the people who will be working on these missions or studying these samples, uh, they, they're, they're probably in school right now and they're gonna be part of this mission uh, and working uh, to help answer some of these questions. So it, it's, a, it's a very long horizon plan. Thank you. Um, the next question is, will optimism ever see Mars's soil? Uh, will optimism, sorry, ever see Mars's soil? Uh, I just hope somebody can answer this but, uh, and explain optimism's fantastic acronym as well, please. <laughs> Yes, so, uh, you know, it, that is our full scale Earth replica of the rover that we uh, test on Earth. So we have Perseverance on Mars and we use, usually when we send sequences to Mars, we are not always uh, running all of those on a full scale test, but we, we simulate them because we don't have the time to execute. You know, you saw in the clip how well, the speeds at which we actually execute on Mars and we would spend an entire day planning for what we were going to do. Uh, which is not very viable uh, so but that vehicle is not been designed to actually be in clean loom environments the cleanliness constraints that we had on perseverance to make sure that we weren't taking biological life with us to mars were very um you know we're, were very constrained we had to make sure and through Oh, I think Vandy might have just frozen. Uh, okay, I'll just go to another question. Um, I can tell you what the echo stands for in the meantime, if you want. Sorry, so oh, can you oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you do the, uh, yeah, do the uh, acronym, because that's fantastic. Uh, optimism is, this is a particular fine example of the field, the operational perseverance twin for integration of mechanisms and instruments sent to Mars. Brilliant. Um, and they, and they, they knew that, and then they, they looked and they thought, oh, it's a coincidence. That spells out <laughs> optimism. <laughs> um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if we've still got, um, if we've still got Vandy or not. So Brian, I wonder if you could answer this one. Um, uh, the question is, what steps and measures are needed on Earth in anticipation of getting the cores back here? Will they be treated as potential hazards? 
Yeah, so so we explore that in the film, and it's very interesting. Um, so the 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 sample return mission, as Vandy said, will not be for at least ten years. It's as she I think she said twenty thirties because it's extremely complicated to get their samples back. When they come back, the most biosecure lab ever constructed will be waiting for them, and that's um, it, the the name for that is planetary protection, um, and it works both ways. I mean, it's it's. I should say, and we say this in the film, that um, it is almost beyond unlikely that, that even if there were living organisms on Mars today in those samples, then they would pose any hazard to Earth, right? It's, it's vanishingly small probability. However, um, it, it is just from a scientific and just from a safety perspective, it is obviously worthwhile making sure that even if it's a vanishingly small probability then you don't contaminate samples you don't contaminate these with uh, you know if you think about it even just contaminating these samples with earth life would be scientifically horrendous because we have spent 20 30 years designing these missions billions of dollars getting it back and then if someone sneezes on the thing then you know you've, you've messed it up so um so the, the the most biosecure lab ever constructed is being constructed for these samples so it will be at the maximum safety and assumed hazard level um and it's quite a challenge and so we explore that in the film and it's very interesting um and as vandy said the other the flip side is that we don't want to send earth life to mars or indeed onwards when we start exploring the moons of Jupiter and Saturn and so on, where, the, where liquid water may be present and more e easily accessible, actually. Um, and so, so the levels of cleanliness and sterilization and care, both in sending things out beyond Earth and bringing things back, is, is quite astonishing, actually. Great. Um, I... Uh quick final question is uh will you shoot a second documentary as a follow-up next year or sooner so we can get the new data please say yes uh so brian i'll probably be there anyway um whether the cameras are there or not <laughs> so if you want to, <laughs> if anyone wants to send cameras there then i'm i'd be i'd love to do it Van, will you have us back please say yes <laughs> Oh, we would love to. You know, it is so important when I see the end product, see what Mickey and Brian did with the images they took, because we, we work with this every day, but it, there's so much going on to synthesize it into coherent whole. I really admire the end product when I see, because I'm always, uh, 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 you know, so impressed with what is, how you tell the story of what we're doing. And I think that's, we would love to have you. and. We could have you do another uh, drive and instrument placement and maybe even some drilling or something, depending on what we're doing that day. Great, the sequel uh, to come. Great, well, look, um, thank you very much um, uh, to Brian, Mickey and Vandy uh, for joining us. Thank you everyone um, uh, who's viewed this and a reminder that transmission of the film uh, is next Friday, 17th of June, 9 p.m. BBC Two, and it'll be available on iPlayer then shortly afterwards. Uh, hope you enjoy it when you see it. Thank you for everyone for all your time and see you again soon. Thanks. <laughs>